Welcome to the Garden Home, and I hope you do feel welcome. The next show is all about how to create compelling entryways in our garden homes. Over the past 20 years as a garden designer, I've enjoyed helping homeowners create private sanctuaries full of beauty and wonder. I find each garden to be a fresh opportunity to explore ways to create uniquely personal spaces. These are just a few of the gardens I've helped to transform into garden homes. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to The Garden Home, a show about design and blurring the lines between inside and out. Now today's show is all about this design principle entry, creating a sense of entry. It is so important. And what I'm excited about is all the examples of entry that we're creating out here at The Garden Home Retreat. Now we're going to take a little tour where I'm going to talk about how I've used this idea of entry. But first I'd like to focus just on how important it is. Think about times when you've walked up to a house you've never been to before and you're not sure where to find the front door. Okay, now let's get started and have a look around. Come on. One of the important underlying principles of the garden home concept is that you take space and you divide it into garden rooms. And each one of these garden rooms has its own characteristics and qualities. And certainly a part of that room would be the entryway into it, which would also have its own characteristics. Now here you're seeing the largest entryway at the garden home retreat. This is the entrance to the property and the road there carries you around up to the cottage and to the gardens and the barns and the farm and so forth. Now, what I love about this entryway is to me, it says welcome, and that's exactly what I wanted it to do. Two entry pavilions or gatehouses anchor or frame the space. You see, I needed something that would fit the scale of the property to mark this entrance. Now, I have to say, these buildings started out with a humble beginning. You see, it was a simple concrete slab and cinder block walls. These walls were then covered with a beautiful stone quarried nearby and applied by master craftsmen from a local stone yard. Then it was time for the carpenters to step in, and they built the trusses for the roof, which was then clad with a metal roof. And this same roof matches the roofs of the barns and eventually the roof of the house. Then the trim, which is quite bold on the gatehouses, was painted white, and I made sure that the paint is guaranteed to withstand the elements, because the last thing I want to do is come down here and repaint year after year. Then I did something dramatic. I painted the stones. I used a lime wash paint and I colored them the soft butter yellow. You see, lime wash is an old European method of preserving the exterior of a building and giving it a different color coating. I applied thin coats to a clean surface. The lighter the application, the less color will come through. Now, if you want to make it darker, you just progressively add more coats. You see, I found this technique ideal for turning unsightly garden walls made of cinder block or brick into much more attractive spaces. Now I know that all of those various elements may seem disconnected, but actually what we've done to help organize the property, use color to create a hierarchy between the formal elements and the buildings of utility. Let me give you an example. Here you see that the body of this building is a cream colored lime wash, and this is a, a white trim that goes all the way around the fencing and the trim on the buildings. You'll see that same color pattern up at the house. The red roof is here. You'll see the red roof at the house. So this element and the house will be the same color. Now you move to the buildings of utility, the barns, uh, the little work sheds, and even the chicken house. They're painted a dark brown stain, which comes from the darkest bits of brown in the trees and the bark. It also has the red roof, which comes from a color in the stone. And then the trim around the windows is lichen colored the same lichen that grows on the trees and the rocks that we've used to create the stone walls. Now this carries over to elements in the landscape as well. For instance, the fencing. The fencing around the barns is a four-board classic brown fence. It matches the barns. The fences around the house and these gatehouses at the main entry 
white picket. So as you can see, color and the use of the same element over and over in certain areas is helping us organize the property and it's also creating greater sense of harmony. Now let's step over here for just a minute. Inside each of these pavilions we're going to apply two different processes that will finish out these buildings. First the floor will be acid washed and second the walls will be transformed from cinder blocks and given an old world finish using stucco and stones. Butch Bennett explains the process. What do you say, Butch? Hey, Ellen. How's it going today? It's going great, man. Let's you see. got it going on here. Yeah. What are we on the, the last phase of the, the gatehouses here? Yeah, we're just putting the finishing touch with some plaster work. Oh my gosh, look at that. <laughs> I know you were a little concerned about the lime wash. <laughs> no, I'm I'm really I'm really beginning to see where you were coming from. I can see stone color began to come through and in a few years. Yeah, it's getting really, that aged really, look. Really gonna be nice. Yeah, the yeah. lime wash will do that. Yeah. So what's going on today? What are we doing? The guys are putting just the final coat of plaster on in there. Uh, to dress up the insides of these old buildings. That we're, we're, they're using a method to sort of look like it was done a couple hundred years ago, you know. Well, this is a method that's been done for thousands and thousands of years. Exactly. Now, is this the sort of thing that uh, an average homeowner could do with, with success? Yeah, yeah, and, and you know, on a small scale, you know, sure. sure, yeah. Well, we've got some doors to hang and a few light fixtures to put up, and um, I think we're about to wrap it up. We've got a nice, Big step stone uh, picked out for your step coming out of there. Oh, also. great. So, yeah. Yeah, just to get that in there and that'll be part of this finishing up process. So. Well, Butch, it's just looking wonderful. We really appreciate all your help and enthusiasm. We appreciate being involved in it, Alan. Thank you. Now, we'll check back a little later in the show when the construction starts on the finishing touches. When thinking about the landscape around the entryway here, I wanted to keep the design very simple. I just wanted a few large things like this big cedar. But let me tell you, it took some friends with some big equipment to help me out here. That's why I called Robert Sanders from Environmental Landscape. So Robert, what do you have here? Well, we've got some old boxwoods that came from uh, Central Kentucky. They're uh, wrapped up to protect the foliage from uh, wind burn for the trip down here. Robert, these are great, but I thought you were just bringing a pair to go on each side of the gatehouses. Well, when we dug these up, I realized that they were a little weak on the back side. So what we try to do with large boxwoods is put smaller ones next to them, nestle them in and cloud them so they have a nice look as though they've been on the property 35 or 40 years. I think they'll look really nice. Oh, that's fantastic. That really will give this place a more established look immediately. This, uh, this worked out real well. We're on a historic project in Kentucky, and for maintenance of the house, the boxwood garden has to be dismantled. So they either cut them down or dig and save. And we always encourage dig and save. Sure, particularly plants like these. These are fantastic. Sure, these are approximately 60 years old. Now, Robert, boxwood are a shallow-rooted shrub, so you can get a really sort of flat root ball. What's your rule of thumb on the diameter? Well, Alan, if you can get 10 inches of dirt for every inch of caliper on an evergreen shrub, that's ideal. And the boxwoods are particularly fine-rooted, and so the root, a large root ball is not necessary as it would be on some other types of trees. They're very easy to transplant and getting plenty of humus in there, that's really all you need to stimulate that root growth so these won't really be shocked too much by transplantation. That, that's exactly right, and a nice two inch layer of mulch and keep them good and wet, not drown them, but just nice and damp, and they'll, they'll thrive and never know they've been moved. Okay, we've seen some examples of entry here around the Garden Home Retreat. You can see why it's so important. Not only can it direct you to a certain place, but it can also direct people along a path. Like in this case, you can come through that arbor and you can be brought up the path here to see this beautiful flower border. Now about this arbor, it was painted white. So I painted it comfort green. That's sort of the, I guess, mascot color for out here at the Garden Home Retreat. And I think that that sort of gray glaucous green blends well with all these different colors. Because you can see, not only do we have blooms out here in this flower border, we have lots of foliage plants. 
Which reminds me, plants themselves can herald a sense of entry. I often use evergreen shrubs like hollies or boxwoods to place on each side of an entryway to say, hey, this is an entry. And here in this flower border, I'll use big, bold groups of foliage plants like coleus or alternathera and then put flowering plants in between them. Now, staying with this idea of plants helping us accent entries, I think this arbor just screams for something growing over it. And we're going to get to that. I'm going to put something on it eventually, like maybe an old-fashioned rose. Can't you just see a new dawn climbing over it, or a Lamarck, or even a Lady Banks? Or how about that Frau Karl Drewski? Well, anyway, roses would be a natural. But what about some things that maybe are a little more off the map? You might try something like scarlet honeysuckle. Now don't confuse this with wild honeysuckle that's invasive. This is a North American native plant and an attraction not just for guests in the garden, but also for some of those winged visitors such as hummingbirds. And the equally beautiful and hummingbird friendly trumpet vine is a southern native but grown widely across the United States. And a lot of folks shy away from wisteria because it can be so aggressive but give the American version a try. I think you'll be pleased. And then there's some of the old Southern standbys, such as Carolina jasmine. In mild coastal areas, don't overlook growing bougainvillea and mandevilla up and over an arbor. The large blooms are sure to wow guests. And if you're in a hurry to get something growing and you're looking for a little garden whimsy, I recommend gourds. They'll take off in no time with fantastic shapes and forms, a great ornament to an arbor from summer until fall. Okay, we've seen this example. Let's head a little deeper into the garden and take a look at another one. Now this is one of the most important strategic points in the whole garden home retreat. It is the central axis point where the east-west axis meets the north-south axis. So when you're moving from east to west or west to east, as we're doing here, I just simply made a break in this needlepoint holly hedge to create a sense of entry. And then I change the medium that you walk on. We go from lawn here to chat or a fine crushed gravel to walk on. Now, if you take the view from the house and you look down the north-south axis, you see a spectacular view. But in the foreground, you see a series of stone steps, a great entry punctuated by boxwoods on each side. And then you go down another set of steps through a rustic gate that carries you out into the orchard. Now, I love this rustic gate because we have an entire fence of it. It was so easy to put together and it serves as the perfect perimeter for this flower and vegetable garden. As you can see, it's made of rustic materials. So the further we get away from the house, the more casual or rustic or less refined the materials become. Now I have to say, when I first saw these fences, I was impressed by how easy they are actually to install because they come in panels pre-made. You see, each section connects with pegs that slide through. It's really a nice old world touch, don't you think? Now at each end of the vegetable garden, we have entries that lead you out of this area onto a chat path that takes you back around to the flower border up top. These entries are made evident to visitors by the grape arbors that are painted that gray-green color. Of course, the grapes continue to grow, and you probably won't see much of the arbors in years to come. On one end, the arbor takes you to a circular path that goes around a big brown turkey fig. We've really enjoyed trying different ornamental grasses in the beds this year, and in the spring, the Saravan Fleet roses are a highlight in this part of the garden. Now, we've seen lots of examples of creating a sense of entry, some more elaborate than others. I have to say that this little space here is one of my favorite places to work out here. It's more intimate, it's smaller. I've got a hedge of needlepoint hollies around the greenhouse, which is the center point, and flanking each side, accenting the entry, I have some of my favorite plants. I grow things like Dusty Miller, various kinds of sedums, angelonia, you name it. This is the perfect place for me to get a few things done. Today I'm potting up some containers with some fall vegetables. In this case, a Bloomsdale spinach, which is so easy to grow. It lasts such a long time, even in a container. You may think it's odd to grow salad greens in a container, but if you don't have much space, it's perfect and easy to do. You can just do it in minutes. All I do is just spread the seed over the soil like this push the soil around, I'll add a little bit more. All you want to do is cover them with about a half inch. And in eight to 10 days, 
the spinach will germinate and within three weeks I'll be harvesting spinach. Not bad, huh? <music> When I design a garden, the entry is one of the key elements that we work out with the client. Here are just a few garden entries that you might draw inspiration from that I've created for people around the country. There are two garden gates that herald the entry into the rooms of this French country garden home. First, the front entrance. There's no doubt that this is the way to the front of this stately home. Now, with the same property, if you go to the back entrance, it's not only functional, but it also helps to screen a view. When we designed this garden, we wanted to make it as private as possible. Across the street, a neighbor's house would peer right in, but by making the gate tall and curved, a slight arch at the top, we were able to provide additional privacy to the garden below. And the materials we chose helped to tell a story. You see, these large wooden gates, which, by the way, are made of the same materials as the one in the front, long-lasting Spanish cedar, create a feeling of security. And even though they're new, they feel very old. Even the hinges and latches add to this feel. Now, if you're into wrought iron, you might be interested in this particular garden. This is a gate I designed for a house that was built in the 1920s. It has a colonial feel to it. And I painted these a color green that matches the roof tiles on the house. It's associated here with painted brick and a beautiful climbing rose. <laughs> enjoy hearing from you all and today we have a photograph of a house in Georgia. Now this belongs to Patty and she wrote me and she said look I'd just like to spruce up this house. What do you think? Should I change the roof etc? So let's take a look at it. Now Patty has an asphalt shingle roof currently and her question is if she went with a metal roof, a red metal roof, how would that look and does it matter that there are no other houses in the neighborhood that, that have a red roof like that? Well, I don't think that really matters. You need to do what really you think looks good. I, I like the idea of a metal roof. In fact, we're using a uh, standing seam classic metal roof at the Garden Home Retreat. These will last a long time. So um, I think I would look into that, Patty. Now, as far as the landscape goes, just a few suggestions here that I think could help spruce things up. First of all, it looks like you've got a crepe myrtle tree here that's blocking these windows. I would probably move that over into this flower bed at the end of the house. And in its place, I would put, since you're in Georgia, I would plant a camellia, Camellia japonica so beautiful in the winter. They begin flowering at Christmas right through January and into February. And then I think what I would do with this lattice just under the house, I would paint that a dark, dark green, the color of your shutters up here, and just let that bit of white go away like this, you see, all right? And then in this flower bed here, it looks like you may have azaleas planted. I would plant one single white dogwood there, and I would come over here in this flower bed and add whatever color azalea you have here, I would add some back into here to serve as a screen and balance it. And then here in the front, I would make this bed a little larger across the back and then plant some evergreens probably about four of them, a simple Hellerai holly or boxwood, just some small leafed evergreen, and then underplant this all in one type of annual flower. You could change it out. In the spring, you could use, well, throughout the winter, actually, in Georgia, you could grow pansies, just do all white pansies, and then in the summer, you could plant it in white begonias or white lantana, and then I would either plant a clematis to grow up over the mailbox like this, or you could use like a jasmine, like one called Madison, star jasmine. It has an incredible fragrance. Well, Patty, those are just a few ideas. Good luck on your project. It's really a great looking piece of property. Well, it 
looks like the guys finished up the floor in here. You know, some time back I told you that we'd get around to dealing with the floor in these two little gatehouses at the entry to the garden home retreat. You know, they're just concrete slabs, but I thought, hey, here's an opportunity to do something decorative. Well, you know, we built these out of concrete blocks and then wrapped them with native stone. The big surprise was that I applied this lime wash on them, so I covered up the natural stone with this material. A period detail from the 19th century, which just gives the place more authenticity. On the inside, we did a stucco finish all the way around. Again, a period detail, where you get bits and pieces of some of the stone sticking through. Again, to add to the authenticity. Now, we just had a basic concrete floor here. And I love this idea of using concrete stains. These things really work, but there's some things you need to know about it. For instance, here I used a semi-transparent concrete stain that's a natural color. Now when I say natural, I wanted something that matched the stucco and some of the base stone blocks around the edge here. We've just applied the semi-transparent stain, which by the way is water soluble. One gallon of it, they say on the can, well, it would cover 200 to 400 square feet. This is 150 square feet and it took an entire gallon to cover this properly. Now, what you need to realize is they say it takes two hours for it to dry and it doesn't need to be applied in full sun. I've already been waiting here for two hours and it's still not dry, so I'm thinking it's going to take a full day for this to dry completely. Now, once it dries, you can put a sealer on it, which will give it sort of a wet look, but it'll also protect the surface. Now, the way you apply this stuff is with a sprayer. Just pick up one like this, but the thing you need to remember if you use a sprayer, just plan on throwing it away because the stuff clogs it up so you won't be able to use it for anything else. Now, what's interesting about these concrete stains is that you can use them on interior and exterior surfaces and they come in a wide range of colors. So, you know, when you're dealing with a mundane surface like just ordinary concrete, this is a good way to give it a little style. This idea of creating a sense of entry or accenting an entry works hand in hand with another design principle, and that is framing the view. Views are so important, and I have to say that I got really hooked into this idea of creating views and vistas when I was a student in England in the 18th century. There was a well-known landscape designer by the name of Humphrey Repton who made these marvelous circuitous drives that only revealed bits and pieces of the estate or the property that he was designing. And he would save the house for the very last and the best view. So I tried to employ some of Repton's ideas of the picturesque right here. Now Repton was well known for creating these books that showed before and after scenarios. He would do a little painting that showed the before and then he would have a flap that he would fold over and that would reveal to the landowner what the changes that he was proposing would look like. Pretty clever, huh? Now, if we go to the house, we also considered the views there. We're fortunate to be able to do both garden and house at the same time. Because of this, we were able to select specific views out the windows of the home. The upper stories will be afforded views out onto the river and grand overviews of the vegetable garden as well as some of the pasture. The lower floors will take in views of the orchard and peer down onto the fountain garden. Not to mention, you'll have a front row seat on the croquet lawn. You see, framing views like these are like capturing a moment, whether it's with windows in our homes or structures like these in the garden. And even on a broader canvas, you can see here the two buildings of utility. Those two barns actually frame or bookend the garden home retreat from this vantage point. Well, that's all the time we have for today's show. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have, and I hope you've carried away some ways to think about the way you enter your garden and your garden home. Until next time, from the Garden Home, I'm Alan Smith. More information about today's topic and other topics covered in this series can be found at pallensmith.com. On an upcoming episode of P. Allen Smith's Garden Home, the Garden Home is all about blurring the lines between inside and out and creating creative and manageable outdoor living spaces. We'll take a look at a number of garden rooms, both in my garden and gardens of some of my design clients. 
We'll talk about ways you can use furnishings outdoors and make the most of your outdoor spaces. Looking forward to seeing you in the garden home soon.